that's in this place. I'm reminded of Matthew, the 18th chapter, and the 20th verse says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, and I believe it's more than two or three in here in his name, there I am in the midst of them. So we are approximately six days into 2015. And while I'm getting ready to do my little introduction here, if the guys would put on the um, screen for me, if you would pick up uh, Genesis, the 22nd chapter, first to the fifth verse in the Amplified, uh, in the King James Version for me. But as I was thinking, we are just about six days and 2016 into the new year. And 2015, do you realize, will be ended, will be over. And I don't know about you, but I don't know where the time has gone to me so quickly. And as we embrace a new year that lay before us, I want to use uh, these verses for your prayer for consideration. And so those of you that maybe have your Bibles and uh, Genesis, the 22nd chapter, the first through the fifth verses, and I'm going to use for this scripture this morning, King James Version, which is my preference. You may use uh, the Amplified Version. I'm a little bit old school. And we have it on the screen. And it reads as thus. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac and his son, and laid him on the altar up on the wood. And the Bible says in the 10th verse, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thy anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. I want to use for a subject briefly, if I can, this morning. Lay down your Isaac. Lay down your Isaac. If you pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for this opportunity to proclaim your word and your name, Jesus. Now, Lord, I cannot do anything without you. There is no preacher but the Holy Spirit. There is no word but your word. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Speak now, Lord. Teach, Lord. Inform, Lord, if you please. Use your handmade servant, Father, if you speak, please. Speak through my mouth and think through my mind that those that are listening shall not be able to resist, not rose, but the wound of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Lay down your Isaac. 
Genesis, the uh, 22nd chapter, is an, an amazing chapter of the Bible. It's amazing dramatically. It's amazing inspirationally and prophetically. And it is a vivid parallel of the offering by God of his son, Jesus Christ. And as amazing as this story is, and because of the nature of it, at first glance, it may appear offensive to some of us. But sometimes I have found out that the only way that God can get some of our attention is to do the impossible, to do the ridiculous, to do something out of the ordinary. There is no other story, I believe, in the Bible that has ever puzzled people of the faith more than this story. And the first thing that people are puzzled about is found in our beginning scripture, Genesis, the 22nd chapter, and the first verse. And it says, and it came to pass that after these things that God did tempt Abraham by telling him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, and the very one that he and Sarah had prayed for so long, and God had miraculously blessed them. But can the scriptures contradict itself? Does not the apostle James tell us in James, the first chapter, the 13th through the 15th verses, that God tempts no man to evil? Now, the word in this case, tempt, is used in the Bible in two distinct senses. Sometimes to tempt in the Bible means to lure into sin, to seduce, or to act as a decoy for wickedness, and to lure someone from the right path into the wrong path. And there are many examples of that in the Bible. However, God never tempts men or seduces men to sin. The Bible said that if we are lured away, it is by the corruption of our own lust, not by God. But in this sense, the word tempt is not to, to seduce, but to put a person under a test or a trial. God deliberately and God intentionally placed Abraham in a situation in which his character as a man of God was on trial. Sometimes God Ask us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems to be unreasonable, and expects from us what seems to be impossible to us. And these are times in our life, many times when our only job is to just do what? Take the next step. We are called to figure out the big picture because we can't. We are not called to try to explain it or anything or figure it out. It's just to take the next step. God says, go, and all we need to do what? Is to hear, receive, and do what? Go. He says, stop, and we are to stop. He says, give your dearest possession and we offer it to him, and this is the true life test of faith. That's all we do. Life for the beloved of us is full of trials and tests. God tested Abraham to prove or to refine his faith, and God tests us also, not because he is dissatisfied with us, but he tests us because he loves us to bring out the good in us, to bring out uh, the best in us, to bring us into a place where we need to be. I want to tell you this, that untried faith is not faith at all. See, you may think that you have a lot of faith. You may think that you know how you are going to handle a certain situation if you were in that situation. But actually, you don't know what you'll do until it happens to you. So untried faith is not faith at all. And let me tell you what. 
We need to just trust God and to obey God. If you put on the screen for me, Romans, the fifth chapter, third through the fourth verse. Let's read that. Romans, the fifth chapter, third through the fourth verses. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation work at what? Patience. How you think you're going to get patient? You better stop asking God for patience. Because guess what? When you ask, <laughs> look out. You're going to get it. And patience experience. And experience what? Hope. Amen. You don't know what you are made of until you are tested, until you go through the fire. You don't know. Now the second puzzle in question in verse 2, God say, said, take thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest well. Well, what about Ishmael? Ishmael, we know, was the first son of Abraham's by Sarah's Egyptian servant, Haggai. And it was not that God did not love Ishmael. Oh, no, that wasn't the case. But Ishmael was Abraham and Sarah's attempt by their own means to do what? Help God fulfill his plans. And you know what? We cannot be hard on them because we have tried to help him ourselves. Many times. We have made the mistake of not trusting and obeying, but giving God a little help. And when we have done that, we have ended up with the biggest mess. A mess that we have to pray to get out of a mess. <laughs> and you know it's true. <laughs> you see, some things God allows to happen. This son was the son from the flesh out of God's permissive will. His permissive will. Sometimes, do you realize that God lets you have what you think you want? And then when you get it, you don't want what you think that you wanted. <laughs> it's true. And he does. So, God had great plans for Ishmael also to become a great nation. Genesis, the 17th chapter and the 16th verse. But the thing about it is that we need to leave the business of a God alone. Because the Bible said that his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. And every time you get ready to get into the business of God, you need to think of that. This is not my business. This is the business of God. And you need to leave some things alone. You see, Isaac was the only son of Abraham's wife, Sarah. And he was a direct link to the lineage of Christ Jesus. We see Abraham here really as a poster child for Proverbs, the third chapter, and the fifth verse. Because Proverbs, the third chapter, and the fifth verse, would you put it on the screen and let's read it. And I know this is one of Mama Annie's favorite scriptures. And it said, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. But in all thy ways, what? Acknowledge who? Him. And he will do what? Direct thy what? Thy path. So early in the morning, Abraham got up. He trusted in God. He was a poster child for this scripture. He got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, verse 3 says. And you know, when you hear from God, we hear from him all the time. Sometimes we dismiss what we hear because we want to do our own thing. But I find that the moment that you hear from God and God speaks, 
You should do it quickly. Just do it quickly. So Abraham saddled his donkey. He got up early in the morning. And it seems that Abraham did, and this is what I liked about him. He didn't get on the telephone. <laughs> he didn't consult anybody or tell anybody what he was getting ready to do. Because now you knew if he had done that, people would have told him, you are out of your mind. You are crazy. What are you doing? He didn't uh, ask for uh, what somebody's opinion was. Or do you think I really heard from God? Or do you think I'm going crazy? He just trusted God. Because Abraham knew that to consult with others would just weaken his faith. They would try to talk him out of it. And they would try to talk him out of obedience to God. Have you ever been tried to talk off being obedience to God by somebody? And, that's, uh, and a lot of times we talk too much. We do. We talk to him. When, when, when God is speaking to you, you need to shut up. You need to keep a lot of things to yourself and let him work it out and see how he's going to work it out. Everybody is not always happy <laughs> for the information sometimes that you would give or that you would tell. And a lot of people would sway you from doing what God would have you to do. So, so a lot of times we just need to keep things to ourselves, trust and obey. Because it's best not to give opposition a chance. Perseverance and faith does not need public approval when you have heard from the Lord. Now in my own mind, Abraham truly, I'm thinking I have an only son, which I do, Vincent. And in my own mind, Abraham truly must have the opinion that he had no authority to tell God no. What? Even if God did not make any sense, and a lot of times in our lives, God doesn't make any sense because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And he wouldn't do, he doesn't do things the way we think he should do them. Because, you know, we always are trying to tell God how he should have did it or what he should do. <laughs> and you know we do. God, how, I, I mean, how are you going to get this out of that? I don't see it. And we do. Because we walk not by what? Sight. But by what? Faith. And the Bible said in Hebrews that faith is a substance of things hoped for. And the what? Evidence of things, not what? Seen. But then Hebrews 11 and the 6th verse said, Without it, it is impossible to do what? Please him. For he who cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. Come on, talk back to me. How am I right about it? So Abraham thought, well, I, I, what authority do I have? To tell God no, even if it don't make any sense. It must have been the longest three-day donkey trip up the mountain to which he was directed to go. Abraham thought, how can I lay down Isaac? Isaac is my only son. How can I lay down the son that, a that Sarah and I have prayed and wished God for so long? But faith leaves the how in the hands of an almighty God. So by the time that Abraham got up to the mountain, he had already rationalized in his mind the whole matter. Abraham said, well, when does God make sense? Now I got to remember that this is the same God who gave me and Sarah Isaac when I was a hundred years old. <laughs> a hundred. 
Turn to Genesis, the 21st verse. Look at it yourself. Does that make sense? No. Turn to me, with me. Genesis, the 21st chapter. 21st. Y'all got it? There they come. And let's read. And the Lord visited Sarah, and he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Go on to, uh, we're going to go on to the uh, fifth. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Does that make any sense? Not at all. So even though he did not know what was about to take place, he knew God was a promise-keeping God. That's proof right there. That he could not lie. He knew that God was not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Had he said it and not do it, or had he spoken it and not make it good according to Numbers 23 and 19. And then Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 17th through the 19th verse. If you'd get that on the screen for me. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 17th through the 19th verse. The Bible said that by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. He knew that God was able to raise him from the dead. We are always trying to seek our own individual rights, you know and our own independence from God. The God who breathed the breath of life into our nostrils, the one who knows the very hairs on our head, the one who knows us better than we know ourselves, the one who said, I know you're uprising and you're down sitting, the one who said there is not a th thought, there is not a word on your tongue that before you speak it, I know it completely. We are always trying to receive our independence from that God. But the scripture says that when Abraham got up to the mountain called Moriah, he gave this instruction to his servants. He says, stay here with the donkeys and go with me and the boy he said, stay here with the donkey while me and the boy go over to worship. And then we, meaning him and his son, would come back. Now, I wonder, did you get that? Stay. Now, he knew God had said sacrifice Isaac. But he said now to the servants, I want you guys to stay here. While me and the boy go up and worship, and then we'll be back. So obviously, he had already figured out that he didn't know how God was going to do it. But he just knew that he was able, able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we may ask or think, according to the power that worketh in him. He didn't know how God was going to do it. But he knew that God was going to do it some kind of way. He trusted that he may not understand it. 
But I just know, God, you're going to work it out. I might not be able to see it right now, but God, I'm trusting you. Because for Abraham to say, me and my boy will be back, he knew that God had, God had to do something. And he didn't know what the something was, but he knew God was going to do something. All I know is that God promised me, Abraham is saying in his own mind, that the, the boy, and I don't know how, but all I know that I trust God. Do you know that the highest form of worship to God is our obedience? It's our obedience. You see, it is one thing to know the word of God, but it's another thing to trust and obey. Now, if you want a good definition of faith, well, I'm glad you asked because we walk by faith, as we said, and not by sight. Because sight says, fill out the job application. And faith says, go head on and plan on your first check. Sight says, this thing don't look right, and it seems that it's not going to work out. But faith said, I'm not going to wait till the battle is over. I'm going to shout right now. I need somebody here this morning who know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about walking by faith. And when I told you that when I did not ask God for a, a, a healing in my body, I didn't ask him to take away the pain, I just asked him for an option. And when I got to the doctor, he said, we got an option on the table. That's all I knew. I didn't know how God was going to work it out. But I'm a living witness standing here letting you know that I know he's able. And I know what he can do. I know what he will do. I know. The ninth verse says, we see Abraham now build this altar. And he's laying the wood in order. And he's bound in Isaac his son. And he's laid him on the altar up on the wood. Now I need y'all to help me preach this. I need you to help me end it. And I need somebody to put their hands on Abraham's heart now. Put your hand. Can you hear his heart? Almost beating. Think about being a mother and a father now. And you know that you're getting ready to give up your only. This is all you got. Put your hand on your heart. Help me. Can you hear Abraham almost breathing out of his chest? Heart breathing. Don't know how he's going to do it. Because in between the coming down of that knife, he knows that, God, you got to do something. I, I don't know what you got. You got to do something. And brothers and sisters, if you got faith in God, in between now and your next problem, you know that, God, you got to do something. You got to do something. Between now and your next doctor's appointment, your next doctor's visit, God, you, gotta say, God, you just got to do something. Between the next time you got to pay this bill and you don't know how the money's come, you just got to say, God, I don't know how it's going to work out. I can't see the money, but you got to do something. Now the 10th verse said that Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son, and when God saw that kind of faith. The angel of the Lord called unto him and said, Abraham, 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 do the boy no harm. God said that now I know that thou hast not withheld thy only son from me. And in that moment, Abraham looked up and looked around and saw a ram caught by a thorn in the thicket by his horn. Now, I want you to know this. That ram did not get there by accident. I hear pastor say, the planning of God. I hear God say, uh, uh, pastor say, the timing of God. 
That ram didn't get there by accident. If it did not get there because Abraham had good luck, there is no such thing as good luck. No, when Abraham and when Isaac was walking on one side of the mountain, I want you to get that. That ram was walking on the other side of the mountain. When Abraham and Isaac got up on Mount Moriah, that ram got up on Mount Moriah because God said, I shall supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus in Philippians 4 and 19. So whenever you get to your storm, whenever you get to your trial, whenever you get to your situation, God has already provided in advance ahead of time whatever it is that you need and I dare you to trust him for it. I dare you to stand on his word. I dare you to receive it and to believe it and when Abraham sacrificed that ram he called God by a new name Jehovah Jireh I don't know what your name for God is I don't know this morning what name that you have had to call God I don't know which means God will provide I wonder is there anybody in here that got your own name for God have you got your own name I know one thing. He has been my comforter. He has been my will in the middle of will. He has been my friend when I was friendly. A mother and a father because I've been away from home for 40 something years. I don't know what you call him. He has been my all and all. My provider. My company keeper. And I know he'll keep you. I wonder is there anybody that's got that name because you have to come to your own place of Mount Moriah. You've got to come to your own place of sacrifice, your own place of surrender. If the Lord has made a way for you, come on and help me praise him. Come on, help me lift him up. Sisters and brothers, God wants to provide for you, but this year, you have got to lay down your Isaac. Your Isaac, God said, is laying in the place of God. God said, if you can't give up your Isaac, you cannot have me. I don't know what your Isaac is. It may be unforgiveness, sin. I don't know what your Isaac is. It may be drugs. It may be alcohol. I don't know what your Isaac is. But God is asking a question this morning. Who or what is getting in your way to God? It might be your lust for power. It might be your bad attitude. God said lay it down. Lay it down before we come into the new year. If you're holding on to some past hurt and pain, God said lay it down. It's not worth it. If someone has walked out of your life, let them walk and leave them alone because your destiny has never been tied to anybody that left you. It just means that that part of the story in your life is over and let it go. Don't waste this year. What are you willing to confront? God is willing to heal. What you are willing to change, God is willing to grow. And what you are willing to leave behind, I promise you, God is willing to transform. Lay down your Isaac.